This episode of Where Did the Road Go is brought to you in part by our Patreons. In particular, this month is being sponsored by Lindsay Marie Trebet and Nick Martin. I thank you both so very much. And if you want to become a patron, you can do so at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And now our show. Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. Welcome to this edition of Where Did the Road Go? And tonight we welcome back Mr. John Lorden. How you doing? Hey, good. How you doing, Soraya? It's been a while. It's been uh, a couple of years, year, at least a year. It's been yeah, at, least at least a year a- since you were on. At least a year. Um, and this is my third time on, I think. It is. Yeah, thanks and for having me back. The last time was, uh, no, last time was August 2017, it looks like. Oh, wow. Wow, that's so definitely a, longer than I thought. Yeah. Where so, you been? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Where did the Soraya go? Yeah. <laughs> there was just recently, I'm like, man, I haven't had John on in a while. Mm-hmm. And we put this together really quick. Yep, that's, what, you, that's how we do it. I'm used to getting content out quick nowadays. It, you have three things you're doing now. Well, actually five shows five. total, but yeah, yeah. Right, okay, so you're doing two more than you were doing before. Yeah. I guess that's well, what I should say. Well, and it kind of switched. You know, uh, Before, I had five shows on my YouTube channel, uh, so literally a show Monday through Friday. I had uh, Johnny Vlogs, which was just kind of open right. discussion. Uh, sometimes would be related to kind of true crime stuff that I was talking about in some of my other shows. Uh, I had Searchlight, my missing person show. I had a show called Itchy Mysteries, which was movie reviews primarily of true crime documentaries and films. Uh, And then, of course, Brain Scratch, the kind of unsolved cases show, uh, and Case Cracked, when cases do get solved. How do they get solved? What's the thing that cracks them? So at this point... I kind of scaled back because uh, I was I just I was in this loop of working extremely hard all the time, and I was starting to get people talking to me about trying to do other projects, and I just had no availability for it. So uh, Johnny Vlogs I shelved, and Itchy Mysteries I shelved, and took it down to three shows a week: uh, Monday Case Cracked, Wednesday Searchlight, Friday Brain Scratch. And that kind of gave me some more time to start collabing with other people and building up these other projects. And that's kind of where I'm at now. Okay. You want to talk about, tell people, tell people uh, a little bit about these two other projects that you've started? Sure. Um, So it's interesting because I went through this thing where when I first started my channel and I was doing brain scratch, uh, it was fine. And then I did some missing persons cases and that kind of spun off to searchlight. And at that point I was so motivated to continue helping with missing persons cases. I knew that I wanted that to be a weekly show. Mm -hmm. Um, But then I was noticing that things were getting kind of heavy. You know, I'm constantly looking into these missing persons cases or I'm looking into unsolved murders. And if I was feeling it, I'm sure my audience was feeling it. So that was kind of where Case Cracked came into play. I wanted something that would lift the channel a little bit where we could see uh, at least, I don't know if you could say good, but at least a conclusion to some of these stories and see justice actually arrive in some of these cases and also highlight where police are doing a good job, you know, because in the unsolved cases, it's really easy for Uh, to be critical of, are police really doing everything they can in this missing persons case or this unsolved murder? Right. So, so case cracked was really a good counterbalance to everything, but there's still, um, it's still a hard thing. And I kind of had this dialogue going on with another true crime YouTuber. Her name's Danielle Hallen. Uh, and she was a little bit newer to covering the true crime stuff. And we just started talking to each other uh, just on Twitter and, you know, kind of how do you go about dealing with this when you're starting to feel really down? And we kind of became each other's support network. And I have a couple of other friends in the YouTube space where we were all having these conversations. You know, how do you deal with all this? Uh, Really important conversations to have. You need a good support network because we have seen people completely kind of burn out on this. Kaylee Elise recently uh, has quit 
doing this type of content. And she was a very big YouTuber, uh, worked on content for Rob Dyke, who's also a very big YouTuber, but it was just getting too dark and taking her to places uh, in her personal life that she didn't want to be at. So she had to give it up. Mm. So, so Danielle and I thought um, we should do a project together. We met up at CrimeCon last year. We were the first two YouTubers to to show up at CrimeCon. Uh, they primarily have podcasters. Um, and we sat at the same table and just you know, finally getting to meet face to face and talking to each other. And interestingly, right across the way from us was a booth set up for a podcasting company called Resonate. So we kind of just te- kept talking about, hey, you know, if we were going to do a podcast, what would it be like and, and what, what could we do with it? Uh, and we talked to Resonate a little bit um, because I was concerned about all the technical stuff. I'm already doing a lot for the YouTube channels. And I'm like, really, can I take on another project, another editing job? you know, different tools, worried much more about the sound quality. Um, and it was just through all that, that crime after crime was kind of born. And essentially crime after crime is different. We're still covering crimes, but the topics are quite a bit lighter and not in a way where, um, you know, sometimes there's this, this current thing that's going on with true crime coverage where there's podcasts that are mixing, hard comedy with extremely dark stories um, or even this kind of alcohol trend of, you know, beers and crime and, or wine and crime and things like that. Mm -hmm. So we, we knew that it's kind of a a tricky road to navigate, but we found this format that we thought was kind of fun where basically uh, we would come up with the topic. I would research one story. Danielle would reach the research, the other, we tell each other the story on the show and then we'd let the audience vote for which one they thought was the better story. And uh, for the topics, because we didn't want it to be so heavy, uh, we kind of made it so the show oscillates a little bit. So like the first episode was called Most Bizarre Weapon. And in that, for the story I told, it was about a guy that was um, robbing a convenience store. And he originally said he had a gun on him. It turns out he didn't have a gun. And as he's trying to threaten people, he grabs a pair of hot dog tongs that were in the convenience (laughs) store. So yeah, it's just a naturally funny story. So it's not like I need to add any of my personality to it. You just really tell the story and let it speak for itself. Danielle's story was about a couple that were breaking up and um, the boyfriend called his ex-girlfriend saying, I'm going to ruin your $200 pair of jeans. And by the time she went back to pick them up, he had covered them in wasabi sauce and then was attacking her with the jeans uh, and then covering her car in wasabi sauce also. So it was just this wow. really kind of fun and different format. And we do them once a month and it's just a great way for us to connect. And before we record it, we kind of check in with each other, uh, almost like you and I did, you know, before we started recording today, just mm-hmm. how have things been going, what's been going on in your world. Um, and it's just been a great show and a great relationship that has developed from that. We're getting ready to go back to CrimeCon in June. Uh, we're going to be there together. We have a special event set up for some fans of our show. We've got all kinds of cool little freebies we're going to be giving away. We've got a crime after crime stress ball that's shaped like a police car. Uh, nice. <laughs> magnets, you know, all kinds of fun stuff. So uh, it's it's great because every month, I literally look forward to doing that show. You know, it's just the topics are fun. Spending time with Danielle is always good and uh, we enjoy it and people seem to like, like it as well. So. Okay. And then you also started this uh, actual podcast. Yeah. Well, and crime after crime is as well. We do also release a video version of it. Mm-hmm. Um, but you can find it on, you know, whatever podcasters is on iTunes and Google and Stitcher and all that stuff. But, um, so now that I've kind of brought the balance that I was looking for personally back to the content, there was something else that was nagging at me. And that was that I, on my YouTube channels, I'm frequently looking into cases and kind of consolidating all the information and presenting it to my audience. But there isn't always follow-up that's needed. You know, some of these cases don't move. Sometimes they stay in that position for years at a time, or there's no discoveries that are made. And I wanted to do something that was more of a deep dive 
investigation into a particular case. And I had a couple of friends that I was, uh, another YouTuber named Gray Hughes that I was already friends with, kind of in the same way that I originally met Danielle. He would kind of ask me, hey, John, I'm dealing with this on my channel. You know, how, how can I go about this? How can I try to fix that? And we had talked about trying to do something together, but I could never really quite figure out what it was. His coverage is a little bit different than mine. He is primarily a live streamer. So he'll, he'll do like three hour live streams just wow. about every, every night. Yeah. And mine is kind of more focused research that I'm presenting to the audience. You know, it's pretty much the episodes typically don't go over an hour. Um, so I wasn't really sure how to, how to work that, but I did know that gray had a really good reputation for 3d models map analysis. I mean, he's just such a detail oriented person that it really brings a different dynamic to a conversation about a crime scene or, or things of that nature. And then on the other hand, I had this guy that I had been getting friendly with over the course of a little over a year. And his name is Mike Morford. Uh, he has two podcasts. One is called criminology and the other is called the murder in my family. And he wanted to try to collab on something. And I was like, hey, you know what? Let's talk to Gray. Let's get all of us together. Let's see if we could figure something out here. And that's where we came up with Three Men and a Mystery. So Three Men and a Mystery is essentially a deep dive podcast where every season we're going to going to be looking into one particular case. And for the first season, we picked the case of J.B. Beasley and Tracy Hollett. And these are two young girls, one of them was literally turning 17 on the day that this happened. Um, but they were both shot and found in the trunk of JB's car. Uh. And it's a really tough case because, um, first of all, it took place back in 1999. So you've got all the years that have stacked up on this. You've got rumors that are running rampant all over the place to the point that, um, some police officers that have been accused of some misdoings in this case actually turn around and sue the blogger that is accusing them of it. Uh, yeah, the rumor mill is just crazy on this case. Hmm. And you've got just the heart of this case is two young women that had their lives taken away so senselessly, a community that still doesn't, uh, well, at that point, didn't have the answers about um, who did this, who was responsible. And we basically started production and we knew that there was DNA involved in this case. And something that we were really big on was, can we get the local police department to work with Parabon Nano Labs and to try to do some type of DNA genealogy analysis on this? Um, you know, that's the same technology that was used to crack the Golden State Killer case, the April Tinsley case. I think there's been like 40 cases over the past year that have been cracked using DNA uh, genealogy. And one of them was as old as 47 years. Mm. So it's a great technology. And essentially for people that don't know, it's where they run your DNA or run the suspect's DNA. And they use a, a website called GEDmatch. And then they're able to take that DNA and they start putting together family trees and trying to figure out whose DNA it is based off that information from GEDmatch. And in some cases, they can get it down to the person. Like in some cases, they get it down to specifically, we think it is this person's name. Other cases, they might get it down to, well, it's either this person and a brother of his or maybe this person and his father. In this particular case, um, we, we were trying to reach out to police. Of course, they weren't talking to us. We were calling. We were leaving messages. We were sending letters. Um, and we were even going as far as willing to pay for the DNA testing ourselves or to generate money with our audience to do that. And we start recording episodes and we wanted the episodes to line up with the anniversary of the actual event. It's going to be 20 years on July 31st, uh, 20 years ago that this crime happened. So we're recording the episodes, getting them ready to release. And all of a sudden on this one particular weekend, we hear there's been an arrest. And we hear more details about it. It looks like they contacted Parabon. It looks like they used the DNA genealogy and they were able to find a suspect. 
So at that point, we had a decision to make. We're like, well, we were sitting on four episodes already. We weren't planning on releasing them for like another two months. But we knew that people were going to be looking for the story and wanting to know more details of the story. So we jumped the release schedule and started releasing them um, that following Monday. And essentially, we've been releasing them every two weeks ever since. And they're still going to lead up to July 31st, where we're going to do a special live stream uh, in honor of what happened to those girls. Huh. Okay. And uh, so that's that's available where? Uh, three Men in a Mystery. You can go to www.3meninamystery.com, and that's with the number three. Uh, it's available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google. Once again, just basically every podcatcher, uh, most of the popular podcatchers. There is also a video version of that as well that you could find on my YouTube channel, and that is okay. Lord, Lord and Arts, L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S. All right. And what, do you have any idea what you're doing for the second ser- uh, the second series of this? Um, not quite yet because we're still recording new episodes. Um, we've done some really good things in terms of finding experts. We had a false admissions expert come on. His name's Carl Stinselli. Uh, we had a criminal behaviorist, Sarah Kalin, come on. Uh, we have interviews with Parabon Nano Labs, Jedmatch, and a DNA, a DNA genealogist that are coming up. Um, so a lot of great information that's still coming out about the case. And despite the fact it's been cracked, well, it seems like it's been cracked. Um, the guy they've arrested, yes, there is a DNA match to semen that was found on one of the girls. But now there's this other question about, well, does that mean that he actually is involved in the assault or not? Was that possibly right. a consensual act that happened before these 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 girls were murdered? Yeah. So there is still a question, and we're learning more information about him. Um, we have episodes where we're going into. There was a preliminary trial that has happened, and there was some new information that came out there. So we're covering that as well. Um, so we've still got some work to do uh, on on that particular case. We've just started talking about some other potential cases for season two, but I'm sure we're going to take a little break in between them. So we'll, we'll have a little more time to iron that out. All right. Um, have, have, have there been any updates to like the Elisa Lamb case or anything? Not the Elisa Lamb case. Uh, that one, I don't know that we'll see updates to it. I mean, the last chance that I feel that that case had was the wrongful death suit. And once the judge, um, you know, essentially toss that out in, in a preliminary hearing. Um, I, I think our, our odds of learning anything more about that case disappeared at that point. So, yeah, yeah, there's no one investigating it really. I mean, there's, you know, the police don't consider it a crime, so there's no criminal investigation that's going on. And without the lawsuit to press on that and to force more discovery of information and facts, um, yeah, there's really nowhere for it to go. Hmm. That's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And it's one of those that um, that case will certainly never, ever leave me. It's it's always on my mind. It's kind of become part of the legacy of my channel. Um, You know, there's people that sometimes will recognize me and say, oh, it's the it's the Elisa Lamb guy. Um, So, yeah, it's um, and it's it's interesting to me because that was really the start of all this good that has happened for all the other cases that we've covered for all the donations that we've made to all these cases. I mean, it really all boils back to, um, trying to serve that story, you know, what happened to Elisa and how tragic that is and what can we learn from it? And there's a a case you covered recently on your brain scratch with another Elisa. Yeah. Elisa Gomez. Um, And and, and this one's not so much like the brain scratch to me is more of how the police dropped the ball. It can be. It can be. Um, for, for this particular one, it's it's really tough because we have uh, – and it's interesting because over the past few years, I've kind of seen a lot of cases like this. Occasionally, police will show up and there will be an assumption that the person has actually killed themselves, that they mm-hmm. ended their own life. And when that assumption comes into play so early, the investigation – 
goes completely different. It doesn't really get treated as a criminal investigation. Uh, the crime scene does not necessarily get treated like a crime scene, if it is indeed one, because in those cases, it's, there's not really a, a criminal act that has happened. So um, it's one of those tough cases. You have a, a, a woman that um, gets married, and literally that same day, uh, she goes out to celebrate her her new marriage, goes to a bar with her roommate and her new husband. Later that night, there's some type of altercation. Uh, neighbors call the police because they hear people screaming at each other. By the time the police get there, the screaming has stopped, so they don't do anything about that. Uh, the next morning, I believe it's the husband, if I recall correctly, is calling police to report that his wife of less than 24 hours has hung herself um, in the basement, which is also their bedroom uh, downstairs. And police show up on, to the scene, and Elisa is actually not hanging. She is on the floor, and there is a beam that's exposed overhead, and there is a scarf that is tied around the beam. And what's interesting about that oh, is it's a, it's a longer scarf. It's a silk scarf. And the story is that the roommate saw that Elisa was hanging and tried to cut her down using fingernail clippers of all things, which I'm not sure. Yeah. Why you would. Yeah. It's really bizarre. Um, but there's no real cuts that you can see. I've actually seen photos of the scarf now and there's no section of the scarf missing. There's no section of it that's still tied around her neck. Uh, this is a woman that weighed at least a hundred pounds. Um, it just, it's really, really bizarre to me. And I still struggle with the mechanics of how was that scarf, um, cinched around her neck. If it was cinched in a knot with a hundred pounds resting on it for possibly hours, I'm pretty sure that knot would be pretty strong, pretty taut. Mm -hmm. Um, even if you were able to undo the knot, which I don't think you'd be able to with a hundred pounds of pressure pulling on it. Um, but if you were able to undo the knot, I'm pretty sure you would still see the formation of the knot somewhere in the actual scarf. And yeah. at least from the photos and the footage I've seen, I don't see any of that. Um, so it's one of those cases where you have a family that feels like police didn't investigate it properly. And I believe they were only on scene for like an hour and like a, the coroner didn't even show up. I mean, just it, it gets, it gets handled in a very bizarre way as opposed to many other crime scenes. So family can't really be sure you have the medical examiner's report saying, um, the cause of death in that is yes, they do say it's it's a strangulation, but they won't list it uh, as suicide. They leave it undetermined, essentially. Um, so you're kind of getting mixed messages from the officials on this, but you're hearing from the police, no, we're not going to investigate it because we don't see a criminal act here. The husband invites his friends over. They completely thrash the place. I mean, just demolish the place. I've seen photos of of the house. It was completely wrecked. Wow. They there's graffiti on the walls. There's things that have been like all the cupboards have been emptied out. Um, stuff has been randomly thrown around the room, and there is graffiti on the wall that says "Till death do us party." Um, it's really really haunting to see what what happened there. And the husband goes and clears out her bank account. Uh, takes her new car, winds up getting in a police chase with it and wrecking her car. Um, it's it's a terrible, terrible story. And you have to wonder, looking at all the facts of it, is this someone's plan? Like, did this guy plan on marrying this woman, um, her dying that night, and all of a sudden the next day everything that she owned in the world belongs to him and he's off and running with it? Because that's kind of what happened. Yeah. And it's it's and his background is not exactly uh, good either. No, no. This is a guy that had a pretty troubled past. Um, previous conviction for choking a wife of his, uh, and sh they got an emergency divorce. From what I understand, he served time for that. Uh, yeah, some domestics in his past. Um, drug use, I think, happens after. Um, after the, the Elisa incident, uh, he gets arrested again in a different state. He gets brought back to uh, Minneapolis. And as far as I know now, he's been let out and he's freely walking the streets again. 
And so is there any explanation to why the police didn't do this, uh, I guess, properly? I, it's tough because, um, like I said, I've seen this trend in several cases. There's a private investigator that I've been um, working with a bit named Sheila Wysocki, and she seems to cover cases that fall into this vein as well. And it's just strange that once that initial assumption of self-harm comes into play, that there is no investigation that really happens at that point. Um they're not looking for any type of criminal act. There's just this assumption. Interestingly, uh, I've heard from a police officer who says that he was trained that when he's coming onto a scene, that he can't assume that it was self-harm, that that has to be the very end, that he has to assume that there is a criminal act and investigate all those avenues before he comes to that conclusion. But I can tell you time and time again, I see these cases where it seems like that assumption just comes out way too early. Hmm. And um, now the fa- so the story from the roommate doesn't make a lot of sense. Cutting her down with the clippers, and and you address this in the video. Um, that like why why would she cut her down instead of maybe trying to lift her up higher or just calling the police if she was already dead? Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've I've had people kind of talk to me about both sides of that story. You know that. Uh, if this is someone you care about and you go downstairs and you see something traumatic like this, um, and if you know that they've been there for hours and there's no chance at a rescue effort of some kind, uh, you might not go and try to lift them up or to try to alleviate the pressure, but it might disturb you so much seeing them in that way. You might feel um, like maybe it would be disrespectful to even let these, because you know, you're calling the police and a bunch of strangers are about to be in the house in five minutes. Um, so I, I don't know if I think it's as odd at this point as I did when I recorded that, but the story about the nail clippers doesn't make sense, especially now that I've seen the scarf, there's no section of it that's been cut. Um, that's at least been cut to the point where it would make sense that, oh, that you can see that it was cut here and there's a section of it that's still tied around her neck. There's nothing like that. Uh, the scarf has fringes on both ends and you can see, uh, for the end that's hanging down, the fringes are all still there. Um, so it's, it's interesting cause that friend actually made some statements later, uh, in social media, uh, talking about the husband saying, you know, this is the guy that, that killed my friend. Um, but she seems kind of wishy-washy. I think she might be struggling with some addiction issues of her own. Uh, I am hopeful someday that if she does have the information that she steps forward and provides that information. Cause I really do think that she is a key to getting that case looked at properly. And, and she had posted some, some pretty negative stuff about him on Twitter and then deleted it. Yeah. And yeah. And thankfully it's one of those cases where nothing ever disappears off the internet. Right. You know, uh, people yeah. have screenshots and yeah. So it's, um, I, I'm, I'm still hoping that someday the right life event might happen. You know, maybe she'll clean up maybe she'll kind of dry out. Maybe she'll enter a new relationship or end some other relationships and things will change for her and she'll be willing to speak up because there's a family that really deserves um, better answers in that case. And I, I think she is just such a key, key piece to all that. Now, the 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 Elisa herself seemed to be a very... Uh positive person, not, not the type of person who would likely kill herself. Yeah. This is a woman that, um, worked her whole life in, um, learning about art. Uh, she's a painter. I've seen her last painting, which in a way is extremely haunting. It's actually a self portrait and she has, um, duct tape over her mouth and kind of in the folds of the duct tape, you can see the word silenced. Uh, it's, hmm. it's, it's a really, really haunting image, but, uh, she also was one of a group of artists that worked on a mural that's in the U S bank stadium, uh, out here in Minneapolis where the Vikings play. Uh, and this is someone that really loved animals, took care of numerous dogs, the type of person that, you know, they'd hear that a shelter had run out of food somewhere and all of a sudden she's putting together a road trip to take food out to that shelter uh, when she had a friend that was fallen on hard times, she would buy food and literally leave it on his doorstep. Uh, she was the type of person that took not just animals, but almost other people in when she saw that they needed help. 
And, you know, you have to wonder in a case like this, is, is it that personality that, you know, actually opened her up to this risk? Because, you know, she brought this guy into her house and into her life. And uh, who knows? And she had only known him a month. She met him on Craigslist uh, looking for help moving stuff. Yeah. Yep. Absolutely. And he was a bit younger. She was, um, I th- if I recall correctly, she's 47 years old. And I think he's 30 at the time that they get married. I'm looking at those pictures. And, and then you say on the video at some point that she's 47. And I'm thinking, whoa, she's 47. I know. I know. She's, she's amazingly uh, young looking and it, it she runs looks like she's in her twenties. I know it. Yeah. And, and it runs in her family too. I've, I've met her mother and her sister. Um, I went over and they brought out all the materials that they've been reviewing and investigating. Um, and they've got access to some interesting materials. I'm actually trying to consider how to help them further. Uh, I've spoken to one film team that I knew already. I'm speaking to another at this point. I'm just trying to find the right resources to pull something together to raise more exposure to this case. But, uh, I saw photos of the actual scene. That's, that's how I I have more information now than even the episode of Brain Scratch that I sent to you. Um, I've, of course, seen photos of her on the ground. I've seen um, footage of the first responders actually showing up, including body cam footage that they had. Um, And the bar that they went to that night had some security cameras, and the family has access to all that footage as well. They didn't know how to view it until I actually went and sat down with them, and we figured out how to open those files and um, there's some interesting stuff that happens in there. There's uh, the husband and the roommate can be seen leaving the bar together, but for some reason, Elisa is not with them. Uh, I'd be interested to know a little bit more about that dynamic, that story. Did she leave before them? Did she leave after them? I'm not exactly sure. Uh, there is some footage of them actually inside the bar that we get. We did get of them all together, and it seems like they're just a group of people having a good time. So. How it goes from that to whatever happens that night um, is certainly a big question. Um, But yeah, and her mother has been working so hard on this case. Her mother has a giant binder just full of information, uh, autopsy report, numerous parts of the police reports, uh, social media posts that Elisa had made, you know, weeks and days leading up to all this. Uh, Her mother actually spoke to her on the the day that she got married and, you know, said everything sounded fine, that she sounded happy. But there there was issues prior to that where she said she was going to leave this guy. Yeah, yeah. There was a bit of a a seesaw kind of going on in in terms of that relationship. Um, Things were either extremely well or things were getting kind of bad and she was, you know, reaching out to some people about that. Uh, It's kind of interesting, too, because they were planning on having a wedding in April of 2017. And this all goes down in October of 2016. And her mom was just kind of surprised about, you know, why, why did you guys essentially go to the courthouse and, and get married in this way when you were already planning on having this official ceremony uh, in mm-hmm. April? And she basically told her mom, no, we're, we're still going to do all that, but we just wanted to, to go and get this done. So that's another interesting question to this case. Was there something that prompted that, especially with what you're talking about, you know, that the relationship could be a little rocky here and there. Um, In that case, why would you rush into getting married sooner than you had already been planning? I'm not sure. Yeah. And this this guy's, you want to talk a little bit about this guy's past? Um, you know, I think I've covered the main points on it. Was there something in particular you wanted to? Well, didn't, to didn't he at some point, like, wasn't he living with some other woman and kind of taking advantage of her? That seems to be a pattern. Uh, one of the things that's tricky about this case, um, I'm very interested in having access to the scarf. I think that mm-hmm. there could be some testing done with the scarf, uh, especially just in terms of the physics of it and trying to verify parts of this story. And the scarf is essentially um, his property be- because, you know, all of her assets belong to him. So uh, it's, it's, it's tough. And I was hoping that there might be some angle in terms of looking into if there was some way to void the marriage so that those rights would return to the family in some way. Mm. Uh, and I was hoping that we might find a previous marriage, maybe that he didn't end or something along those lines. Ah, okay. 
Um, we haven't been lucky on that front. Like I said, there was an emergency divorce that happened with the one wife that we, we know he was charged with, um, choking in particular, but, um, yeah, it's, it's just, uh, it's, it's a bit of a mess in terms of, of the past. And there does seem to be some patterns that you see with him, uh, developing relationships and, and kind of using people in that way time and time again. And that's one of the reasons why I thought there might be a shot at, you know, if, if this is a model that he's put together of acquiring things from people, maybe there's some chance that there's another person that he married out there that, you know, he didn't tighten up the paperwork on the divorce for, but we haven't found that. Mm. The, um, now he got arrested after this, was that? Yeah, that was an interesting story. So, um, if I remember right, he's in Oklahoma and essentially, uh, a young man, who's living with his parents. He's 23 years old. His, both his parents are out. He calls his mother and he's asking his mom, Hey, did you say that this guy could move in here? Cause there's some people that just showed up and they're literally like moving stuff into our house. And his mother was like, I don't know who you're talking about. No, call the police. Uh, and he calls the police. His father actually is law enforcement. I can't remember if he's an officer or if he's a sheriff. Uh, so he comes heading home and at this point, um, the, the husband, uh, and a woman that he's with are hiding in the backyard. Um, it's just this this really wacky story, but, uh, that's, that's where he gets arrested. Um, and then they extradite him back to uh, Minneapolis. I think he had some charges from the previous, um, running from law enforcement and crashing the car that he hadn't settled up on yet. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really interesting story. And considering that he's been out for, I don't know, maybe a month or two at this point, uh, considering his history and how he goes from kind of bad situation to bad situation, I wouldn't be surprised if, you know, he gets some other charges coming up here within the next six or 12 months. And, And it seems like, and I think you, you even call him a little bit reckless. Absolutely. Yeah, totally reckless, not well thought out. Um, and, you know, I, I think that there is probably a strong drug component that's going on here uh, that's driving a lot of a lot of this behavior. Um, yeah, more than one of the most reckless and maybe more than reckless. That's what's scary about it. You know, I mean, if this is someone malicious, if this is someone that engineered this death in some way so he could acquire these this money and these assets. Uh, that's a that's a scary thing to think about. It's also scary that he got away with it, like without any any further questioning. If if he is responsible, you know, it's it's like they didn't even look into him. Yeah, yeah, and that's that's what's I think the one of the harder aspects for the family to deal with. Um, there seems to be this just kind of amazing luck that this guy bumps into from situation to situation. Even the fact that he's been released at this point, he was supposed to be in jail for a longer period of time. I I don't know what exactly happened around the conditions of his release here, but it's to the point where some people are even speculating, like, is he some type of informant or something? Like, why is he getting kind of, you know, special treatment or special privileges? It seems like when it comes to his sentencing in particular, um, yeah, it's it's tough. It's really tough on the family because they feel like not enough was looked into, not enough was done. He wasn't really questioned. And of course, they want someone held responsible if that's really what happened in this case. Um, right. But how do you how do you ever get to that if no one's really looking into it? That's that's the real hard aspect of all this. The um, yeah. And I mean, he may not have been responsible. We don't know because we don't know what happened. Sure. But. Like, there's enough there that you would think the police would have at least seriously looked into what went on. Like, like, like him in particular, because of his background, because of the way he behaved afterwards. Yeah. Um, it, it's it, like I said, when we started this, like the, the brain scratch to me is how did the police drop the ball on this? Well, and, and there might be another aspect to the story there. If I, if I do get a larger project on this going, I kind of want to cover this as well. Um, Minneapolis PD over the past few years has had some pretty tough challenges. Um, first of all, there was, uh, body cams, uh, that were finally being deployed everywhere, but then there was some, um, 
controversy about how they were being used, that at certain times officers were shutting them off when they should have actually had them on. And of course, most recently is the Justine Damon case where a woman called law enforcement because she thought that she heard a woman being sexually assaulted in her alley. Right. Law enforcement drives up. Justine runs up to their car to tell them what's going on. And uh, one of the officers shoots her and kills her. Yeah. And that's a case that um, the officer was charged, uh, not formally charged, uh, was sued, if I, if I remember correctly, uh, and has lost. And now the family has got a substantial um, settlement. And this is a woman that was engaged. She was about to get married. Uh, and someone that thought she was helping someone else. And essentially the excuse that the officer that shot her gave was, I just heard this big bang and I saw fear in my partner's eyes. So I pulled my weapon and essentially fired across his partner. I mean, he was sitting in the passenger seat and he's shooting across his partner to someone that came up on the other side. Um, yeah, just a, a terrible story. And you know, Minneapolis is, um, it's a bit of a metropolitan area, especially for out here. There's a lot of people, there's a lot of issues that are, are going on there. Um, so I get that it's a challenge in terms of law enforcement just by the very nature of it. But with a case like this in particular, you want to make sure that, um, that you really know what's happening. And that's the biggest question here. There's, there's really big questions that, we don't have reasonable answers to. And without those reasonable answers, I think you're always going to have this family stuck in this position of wondering, um, you know, what happened and, and do we really have the truth? Yeah. You know, they don't and of course, to have much of anything really. Yeah. And, and of course, don't get me wrong. I, I don't think you could speak to a family in a situation where someone has truly taken their own life and not find someone in that family that thinks it's completely impossible that that's what happened. Oh, well, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I totally understand that aspect of it. And for what Elisa was going through with him, it was kind of a, you know, sometimes a rocky relationship. She's going to leave him. She's going to leave him. No, she's not. She's going to stay. They're going to work it out. Um, you know, could that roller coaster have been enough of an emotional pitch that, that she decided to do something like that to herself? I, I think it's a possibility. I don't know how reasonable it is. And just with the physics of what I see, going on uh, with the area where she supposedly did this. I'm just, I'm struggling to, to come to some form of, of grip with that as that being the default assumption and kind of reasonable assumption at that point. And so now the family has what a GoFundMe set up. Um, Ooh, I can't remember. Do they have a GoFundMe running on that? I, I know you, you talked about some kind of uh, something at the, or maybe it's a put, uh, petition. Yeah, it's a change, change dot org. I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I do believe there's a change dot org petition. Let me just um, pull it up real quick so I can share okay. that with everyone here. Um, and that's that's an easy enough thing for people to do to help out is just to go sign that. Yeah, but, absolutely. Um, and and those types of things, uh, some can be more helpful than others. You never know. It, it's kind of on a case by case basis. Mm -hmm. But in terms of just making a a bit of a political statement about it. Uh, it could be helpful, especially if they try to reach out to someone in politics at some point and they can say, Hey, by the way, we've got, you know, 5,000 or 10,000 or whatever people that have signed this. Uh, but yeah, you can go to change.org and the name of the petition is justice for Elisa Gomez. As of right now, uh, over 45 people, hundred, uh, over 4,500 people have signed it. And what are they looking for? Um, in this case, I think they're just looking to open the investigation again. Um, that's typically how these are, are written up. Uh, they're saying that they would like to meet with a member of the county attorney's office to discuss the matter further, uh, which I don't think is, is unreasonable um, no. to get them that, that type of meeting. Um, so yeah, they're, they're really hoping for more investigation. Uh, and interestingly, they want the Minneapolis police department to, to do it. They just want them to pick it back up and to, you know, take a look at it again. Um, and it's, it's, I do find that really interesting because I've heard stories from the family about certain things that have been said to them and how they've been treated, um, by some of that personnel. And, um, that's one of the tough things about these unsolved cases and something that when I talk to families, I always try to get them 
to understand that you you really want to work with law enforcement on these things. You don't want to work against them because um, at some point you're going to need them if if you are able to bring this to charges being filed or or something along those lines. You're you're going to have to work together with missing persons cases. This this is almost a, a routine thing. If 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 I talk to a family member and they have a missing loved one and it's been more than say 60 days, nine times out of 10, they're going to tell me how they don't think law enforcement has done enough, how the person that they're in contact with isn't getting back to them anymore, or they've had harsh words with them. Um, and it's tough because when you're dealing with something like this, I always find that it's best to try to put a team together. And uh, it, it's you have such hard feelings because you care about this person so much and you feel like these people that should be responsible for helping you you know, we all pay our taxes. We we all pay for these services to be there. Um, I, I understand how hard it is when you feel like they're not doing their job. Um, but but ultimately, without that collaboration between law enforcement and the public, these cases don't get solved. So yes. it, it really does take efforts on both parts. And that's part of the reason why I struggle with, you know, certain cases I'll look into and law enforcement is very helpful. And you can see they're putting out details that can actually engage the public and help us understand what they're looking for and that helps us help them in other cases law enforcement will not release details uh, you know sometimes they don't have public information officers to really do that type of work there's a lot of law enforcement agencies in this country that have less than 50 officers i, I think i heard a stat recently that it was like 80 percent of uh, law enforcement divisions out here are smaller than than 50 people so it's, you know, I understand that it's going to be on a case by case basis, but I do see some departments where it's like, oh, thank God, look how they're handling this. I wish everyone would do it that way. And then you see these other ones where it's like, wow, are you guys really helping on this or not? And this All is right. one of those cases, unfortunately. Yeah. Yeah. This, this, this is really a horrible situation. Yeah. Yeah, it is. And this is another aspect of, my work that um, I'm passionate about, uh, it's not extremely glamorous, I guess you would say, but after the show goes out, you know, after I release an episode like this, uh, it's more and more often now that I'll hear from family members and there's this kind of aftercare aspect that, that comes into play. And that's where I'm just there for them. You know, sometimes they want to talk about, uh, could we get a podcast to cover this? You know, do you know anyone else that might want to help cover this for us? And I'm able right. to, route, you know, I, I'll route them. I'll say, Hey, I do, you know, you've got this missing person case. I know Marissa over at the vanish. Let me talk to her. Let me see if she'll pick this up so we can get some more exposure for you guys and vice versa. Sometimes Marissa will come to me and say, Hey John, you know, we've got this family. We just covered them. They're looking for uh, some YouTube exposure on this. So there's this cool little network of people that are working together uh, with, to help with these cases. But, Sometimes you'll have, like in one case in particular, uh, I had a mother of a young man that, mysterious death, um, he is in Russia. His name's Colin Madsen. Uh, he's a student out there at the time. And she needed help because she they essentially sapped their uh, life savings trying to get this investigation reopened. And you can imagine, this is in Russia. I mean, she she lives here. And she's trying to get Russian authorities to reopen this investigation. So, you know, there's political considerations. There's a lot of legal maneuvering and all that. And she's like, we're finally at the point where we have to ask people to help us try to find justice for my son. And I don't know how to go about this. I don't know what to do. And so, wow. you know, I, I told her about GoFundMe. I told her about, um, you know, we need to get the text really well written for the GoFundMe. So I reached out to another friend of mine. Uh, that's really good with doing that type of stuff. She contributed help in terms of, uh, you know, I kind of put together an original pass on the text. She tuned it up. We brought it back to Dana, to Colin's mother. Uh, and then we said, you know, you should also make a video of some kind. She's like, I don't really have, you know, any way of doing that. Right. So I, I said, well, do you have a laptop? She's like, yes, I do. And I said, okay, we're going to do it on Skype. So um, I set some time aside for her, had her Skype into my machine where I recorded it. Um, had her say what she had to say. I did an editing job on it, helped her release it. 
So, and it's been great because they've generated several thousand dollars at this point. They've been able to, yeah, do the first withdrawal, send that over to the attorneys. The case actually is in a state where it's reopened at this point. So it's really important that we keep those resources funneling there. Um, So yeah, if you are listening to this and you're moved to do so, uh, please go to GoFundMe and search on the name Colin Madsen. And you will see the video we put together. You'll see his mom with her very passionate plea. And you might be able to help that family as well. Well, that's uh, that's really awesome, actually. It's, yeah, uh, it's, for you to have been able to help them get that reopened is awesome. It's, it's that kind of um, help, just being there for them. And sometimes it's just to listen. You know, there's there's occasionally people that are like, hey, John, here's one of, where the case is at. And man, I'm really feeling like this. Um, and it's just to, to be there and to help them through those tough moments is, is kind of a, of a privilege. I remember the the first time I had a family reach out, I was absolutely terrified. I was like, oh my God, are they going to, you know, be upset that I covered this story? Yeah. Uh, Um, and it just turned out to be the complete opposite. They were so thankful. Uh, they wanted to give me additional information so I could do a follow-up segment. And, um, in 99.999% of uh, family reach out that I've had, it's been a positive thing. It's the vast, vast, vast majority. Um, I do have friends of mine that are in this same, you know, true crime YouTube space, and they've had some bad experiences with uh, family members. I've been very, very fortunate that I really haven't had anything like that go on. Well, I, I think you approach it with the, the proper amount of, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, respect. That's been something I really worked for. And that was kind of an original, um, an original thought when I was putting my content together, because when I decided to cover Elisa Lamb's case originally, she was, that story was being used to kind of retell ghost stories, you know, Oh, did you guys see that footage of the creepy girl in the elevator? And she's acting all weird. And Mm -hmm. it's the hotel where the night stalker lived, you know, this guy that killed 14 people and this other, this other person that did copycat crimes of his lived there. And, Oh, we think it's the ghost of the night stalker. That's, you know, in this woman and made her walk up onto the roof and put herself in the water tank. I mean, it was just, it it was really hitting me that I, I, there's a part of me that likes paranormal content. There's a part of me that likes creepy storytelling. Sure. But there there was something about using that story in particular where I was just like, this is not the right story for this. And there's something else going on to this story. And if we do look at it respectfully and just with the eye open to reasonable outcomes is there something going on with her mental health here you know Mm -hmm. we were very fortunate that elisa left a very big footprint of her emotional status with blogs uh multiple different websites that she would contribute to and those stories or or though all that content tells the story of someone that's struggling with her mental health and we know that there's medications that are found there we know she was prescribed medications for dealing with this and there's some question of was she going through a medication change? Was she struggling, uh, not taking her medications properly? Uh, was she in some type of manic state in that footage that everyone has turned into a, a ghost story? You know, yeah. and there's there's a very real conversation to have there that affects many many people. There were so many people that appreciated the coverage and just looking at that aspect of the story because they associated with it. You know, there's people that are like, "Hey, I'm bipolar myself." I totally understand what's what's happening here. I can see that. I've been through things like that myself. Hmm. And and the thing is, I, I think with the internet, sometimes you get a disconnect that these are real people. Yes. And we even get that, like with us personally. I talk to Danielle about this all the time. Uh, and, and Morph and Gray, the other guys on uh, Three Men in a Mystery. There's this aspect of being a piece of entertainment for people. Um, that, that I understand. I know that we're putting something out. Some people are watching brain scratch and they're like, Hey, I've got an hour to blow. There's other people that are watching it. Oh, what case is John going to present this time? And is there something that we can do to help? You know, if that means going to a GoFundMe or going to a change.org, or if it means that it's something local to them and there's a search party being put together, but there's other people where it's, you know, they're watching YouTube and they want to make sarcastic comments at something. And, Mm -hmm. you know, they're going to talk about how stupid your hair looks or that you're wearing a hat backwards or, I mean, whatever is bugging them. There's, so there's this other aspect of 
it's not about the content necessarily. It's about people seeing you as an entertainment object and then whatever they're looking for personally, they're going to play with you as that object to fulfill that need. Oh, well, there's that definitely. Yeah. But I, but I, I think there's also that disconnect that, that people don't, when they look at something like a Lisa lamb, they're not empathizing with this person. Definitely. It's, it's just an image on the screen. It's something to be entertaining or spooked by without thinking about everything that's really going on there. Definitely. Definitely. But although interestingly, if you released the same thing, right? If you released the exact same video, but it was fiction and everyone knew that it was fiction, do you think anyone would, would watch that elevator video? Mm. So there Good is point. an aspect, yeah, there, I, I see what you're saying, but there is an aspect of them knowing that it's real that plays into that entertainment thing that they're looking for. Oh, look how weird this girl is and look what she's doing, you know? Uh, yeah. I, I think if you had an actress shoot the exact same thing, you wouldn't get, you know, 23 million views on it. Hmm. Um, so what are some of the other brain scratches you've, you've dealt with recently that uh, struck you as particularly odd? Um, like any, like any, anything that goes into that fringe category? Uh, this year, you know, I'm still trying to do fringe episodes every now and then. Uh, this year, I've had a little bit of a focus on uh, Antarctic mysteries. Really? Uh, yeah, I did a couple of those because there's some some pretty interesting mysteries. I mean, of course, in one of them, you've got someone that is basically uh, moving between two bases. And for some reason, he lets go of the cable that, that ties the two bases. He's in the middle of a, of a storm mm -hmm. uh, and he is lost. And they send out a search party and they don't find him. Actually, I think to this day, he hasn't been found yet. Um if I remember right, that is the Carl Dish case. Um, and then after that, I, I kind of wanted to do them together. I have occasionally I have people that reach out to me and they do research. And there's this one guy, um, Jay Swallow. Oh, I'm now not going to be able to remember his, his screen name. Uh, I want to say Jay Swallow J, but I know it's it's something else. Um, but he kind of came to me with these two stories and he's like, Hey, do you think that this is something you can cover on the channel? And I'm like, yeah, maybe I should put them together though. Let's, let's do kind of an Antarctic mystery thing. Um, but then they were both too big. Once we actually started <laughs> getting into the details, it's like, Oh, wait, wait, you know, <laughs> that would be a two hour episode. So yeah, Carl Dish was the first one that we did. Um, and it's just, it's, it's an interesting story because, you know, who thinks about being in the Antarctic and being in that type of environment and the risks that are around that and, oh, then, yeah. and what's going on with this guy? Like, once again, is this someone where something has happened to him or is this someone that decided to end his own life and all of a sudden he's, you know, letting go of that line and walking off? Yeah. Um, so it's, it's, it's tough to know for sure. Um, the other case that we did on it, I'm trying to find it real quick cause I want to get his name right. But, uh, it's interesting because yeah, Rodney Marks, in this case, you have someone that is, uh, once again, living in that environment that is almost a story in itself. Um, really smart, educated guy, uh, played in, they had a, like a band that was playing at this base. He played in the band. He had a girlfriend, had a lot going for him. And essentially, he starts getting sick, and he keeps going um, to the infirmary there, and they don't know what's going on with him. And eventually, he dies of poisoning, uh, ethanol poisoning. Hmm. And they're like, well, where, you know, where did he get ethanol for this? They do use it out there for cleaning certain um, devices, but it's usually locked up. And then there's some talk about, well... Uh, were they brewing their own alcohol? Because, you know, in some brew setups, when you first get them going, ethanol is actually produced at the start and you, there's a certain amount that you have to throw out. Um, so is it something like that? Did he actually poison himself? So it's just a big mystery. And, um, I don't know. It's, it's, it was a, another interesting case and it's one of those that it is, it's a brain scratch because it's unsolved because there isn't a firm answer and you really come out of it wondering what the heck happened. You know, did someone actually poison him? Did someone give yeah. him, a, a, you know, was he, was someone upset with him? They wanted to kind of take him out of the picture and that's how they did it. 
uh, some of it, the pictures of his working areas look kind of messy. So there's another theory about did he do that this accidentally to himself in some way? You know, reached for the wrong bottle. Um, I don't know. A lot of a lot mm-hmm. of interesting questions. One of the most, I guess, I don't know how to quite word it. It's um, one of the biggest developments, I guess I would say, that has happened on the show recently is tied to one of those uh, cases that came from Sheila Wysocki. And this is the case of a young woman named Lauren A.G. And she was going out to uh, what was known as Wakefest, um, which is, uh, you know, like a, a wakeboard competition. Oh, okay. And, and staying out there with some friends. And they stayed on this um, piece of land that was really close to the water, essentially kind of like a, a cliff. Like there's a little jetty and there's this cliff that's that's up on it. Uh, they weren't supposed to be camping there, but her, her and her friends set up camp there. And uh, she disappears. The friends kind of assume that she went back to the marina. You know, there's some stories about potentially she had uh, an ex-boyfriend that she was talking to. And maybe she went back to meet with him or something like that. Uh, they go back out to wake fest and later that afternoon, uh, a body is seen floating in the water and it, it turns out to be her. So Sheila has been investigating this case. She's been working with the family, uh, and trying to understand this. And there's some problems with it because on one side of that cliff, if she fell off, like in the middle of the night, uh, which is one of the assumptions, um, it's a pretty much a straight drop and she probably would have gone right into the water. If you try to roll off the other side of the cliff, it's like a 45 degree angle and there is tons of shrubbery and it did look like she had some marks on her body, but not a whole lot. And they did all these tests with trying to throw dummies off that side and the dummies never got into the water at all. Plus where her body was eventually found was in a cove. They've done tests on the water flow in that area and Essentially, the location for where her body was found doesn't make sense. When they did find her, there was this really bizarre triangle imprint that was on her sternum. And there's a photo of it. Um, And there was a a police officer that was actually working as a security guard at a bar that was at this event. And he's one of the first guys that was essentially helping on the scene when she was pulled out. His assumption, looking at the triangle was that it was from the tip of a canoe. And that could have been pretty interesting information because that group of campers was using a canoe to get back and forth from the marina to this jetty cliff where they were where they had their camp set up. So for a long time one of the theories was um, did they move her? You know, was she possibly killed up there and something that happened? And then uh, maybe they tried to throw her down the hill and then she didn't get into the water or it wasn't far enough away from their camp and they got worried and someone went down to the canoe and put her on the front or the back of the canoe and that's where the imprint came from. Um, So the other theory was possibly the imprint came from the rescue boat, that there was some type of hatch on this rescue boat and she was placed on this hatch face down to make this imprint. Hmm. Um, We didn't know the answer but uh, Sheila Wysocki went and found the actual rescue boat. The canoe has disappeared. No one knows where the canoe is. But the rescue boat, um, they got to it. It was about to be sold. And thankfully, they got to it right before that. And they took a bunch of pictures and they took some video footage of it. So I had covered her case back in July of 2018 on the channel. And Sheila started a podcast about this called uh, Without Warning. Uh, so she's been doing updates on this case ever since. And back then I knew about the triangle and I was like, you know what? I need to bring my friend, Gray Hughes, who's so awesome with all these measurements, uh, bring him in on this conversation, bring Sheila back and let's talk about the triangle. And Sheila basically wanted to wait until the podcast hit a certain point before she did that. So we did that. And last Friday, um, that would be May 9th. I released an episode where Sheila came on, Gray came on. And we looked at the pictures from the rescue boat and tried to line up Lauren's body and see if we could make that imprint and make it make sense. And we got to the conclusion originally that it couldn't have been from the rescue boat, that essentially her body was facing a different direction. And the one hatch that did have that angle of of a weird triangle 
would have been facing the wrong direction compared to how her body was actually placed on it because we had a picture of her body placed on it. So we released that. And then the next day I'm working with Gray. We're recording an episode of Three Men. And someone sends in an, e- an email to me. And they're talking about the triangle still. And they're trying to show me, uh, interestingly with vegetables, um, sure. how, how the triangle uh, imprint couldn't have happened the, the way that we were assuming. And it just kind of started Gray and I back down the path of looking into it all again. And Gray had access to materials I didn't have. He had the actual footage of them visiting the boat. And he starts going through the footage of the boat. And I'm like, Gray, there's another side to that boat. And we've got another hatch that's over there. So if they brought her body up and she was on the, the bow, essentially, and her head was facing towards the stern... That might have made the imprint. And uh, so we took the pictures. Unfortunately, they had taken pictures of the hatch, but only on the right side of the boat. We didn't have pictures from the left side of the boat. But we took one of the ones from the right side, and we reversed it. And we took the picture that we did have of Lauren's body, and we just started mashing this composite together with these photos, including the actual red imprint. And all of a sudden, it was like a light bulb. I mean, we, we lined it up, and it all matched up perfectly. Wow. So we took something that essentially has been a mystery for even before I covered it on Brain Scratch back in July, and we finally resolved it. We know that that triangle certainly did come from that boat. Now, does it really help the case? It helps to know that because now we can focus on other things. Right. There's a part of me that was hoping that the triangle could have been proved to have come from a canoe because that would actually tie it to an act of a crime of some kind, you know, the Mm -hmm. body being moved after she had died, which was obvious because the mark was from uh, lividity and and blanching. So it obviously happened after she had died. Essentially, we didn't prove that. We proved that it was part of the rescue effort. So we didn't tie it back to the crime, but at least we know that that's where it came from. And now we can focus on the other parts of that case. Right. That's no longer the mysterious part. Yeah. And it's weird because, um, you know, I've, I've been in this for four years now where I've, I've been doing content like this and things like that really hook in people's brains. Mine in particular, I'm always looking for the physical evidence. Just like when we were talking about the Elisa Gomez case, you know, the, the scarf is just, it's mm-hmm. got my mind completely wrapped up. Um, but this is one of those pieces. When you look into Lauren Agee's case, everyone's talking about the triangle. What is that thing? Where did it come from? Cause it's such a unique and strange mark and the placement of it. I mean, it's right on her sternum. It's like the point of the triangle is literally pointing at her belly button. So I'm, it, I'm, I'm surprised there aren't a bunch of like alien abduction theories based around it. <laughs> there could have been. <laughs> you, you, you absolutely could be right. And especially with the whole aspect of her body winding up in a different cove and the flow of water not being possible. Uh, you know, they're up on a, a hill or a cliff, you know, 90 feet above everything. Um yeah, but there's there's a lot more that's going on with this story. You know, the the other campers that were up there uh, haven't been very forthcoming with information. Um, there, there certainly seems to have been something that happened up at that camp. And did it tie into her demise? Um, many of us think that there's a really strong possibility. But yes. unfortunately, the triangle will not be the answer to it. Now, one of the other shows you sent me to check out was the uh, to Crime After Crime about the murdering mother-in-laws. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So that's and, the most... And that's the oh, most what? I was just going to say, that's the most recent episode we did. We did it for May because of Mother's Day, of course. And it, it was it was fascinating. And you definitely, I mean, it you, you balance out the dark content with a sense of humor. That was one of the darkest ones that we decided to take on. Um And part of the fun of that show for Danielle and I is the research work because the topics can sometimes set us on a very hard research path. Uh, And this one was probably one of the hardest. When you, when you use the term murdering mother-in-laws, like if you were to just throw that in Google right now, Mm -hmm. uh, most of the results that you're going to see are about people that actually murdered their mother-in-law. But that's not what we were looking for. We were actually looking for mother-in-laws who had murdered. Right. Um, and even covering a murder on that show is pretty rare for, for us. We, we talked about it before we did it. And we're like, are we, like I said, we, we have certain episodes that are lighter and certain episodes that are heavier. 
that is certainly one of the heaviest in terms of the content, at least in terms of the crime content. Um, but it turned out to be such an interesting story. I had never heard of Ma Duncan before that. Uh, so for me, in terms of a research job, it was really interesting. Um, it's, it's just, it's such a bizarre story. What'd you think of it? I thought they were both bizarre as hell. Uh, both, both the one you brought in, the one she brought in. I mean, they, uh, but Ma Duncan, I'm trying to, I'm trying to remember which one's which is, is the Ma Duncan one, the one where she pretended to be her, her son's, uh, wife. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. That one was Wow. Yeah, it's one of those stories that just it completely boggles your mind. Um, for you know, essentially, her son started dating someone she wasn't happy with, uh, married this person, and she wanted to get an annulment, so she paid some guy to go into uh, the uh, courthouse with her, and they said that they were her son and her daughter-in-law, and that they wanted to dissolve their marriage, and it actually worked. <laughs> they actually did did process it. Well, uh, wouldn't that get overturned? If anyone went to push the fact, yes. But you know, once that story uh, that story continues, and Ma Duncan isn't happy at that point, uh, she starts talking to people about killing her daughter in law, and she finds these two guys that ultimately do wind up doing that. So, I don't think there's anyone to really contest the finding at that point. And, you know, once the daughter-in-law uh, was deceased, I, I just, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think it came back up. Could someone we, have, have um, contested it? Yeah, I'm, I'm sure. I don't even know how you'd be notified unless, yeah. you know, she used his address and then there's paperwork that's sent there to kind of tip him off to it. But her relationship with her son was also really, really strange. You had um, even after he got married, where he essentially kept his apartment, and his mother, his mother, Ma Duncan, lived there with him, and he would go and visit his wife at her apartment for the early evening, <laughs> and then go back to Ma Duncan and spend the night there. Um, yeah, it was just a bizarre, bizarre it is, story. It is a really bizarre story. Um, what was the other thing that stuck out to me? Um, oh, the 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 killers. They were just like a comedy of errors. You know how I said earlier, you let the stories speak for themselves. Yeah. yeah. I, I did not anticipate that these guys were, I mean, they go to kill. Yeah. I mean, they go to kill this woman. They're supposed to take her to Tijuana, her body to Tijuana. They rent a car from a friend of theirs for 25 bucks. Uh, and this is taking place in the sixties. Uh, they realize the car is not in any shape to make the drive to Mexico. And uh, this is all taking place around Carpinteria, California, uh, just a little north of Ventura. Um, so they realize that they're not going to make it to Mexico. They decide that they're going to go bury her somewhere else. She's not dead yet, by the way. They've, they've attacked her. She's in the back of the car. Um, so they take her to this construction area that's going on. They realize they don't have a shovel. So one of them starts digging in the ground by hand while the other one is trying to finish her, like choking her, trying to kill her, but not getting it done. And then they keep swapping because, you know, the guy that's digging eventually starts getting too tired and they, they switch. It's terrible to think yeah. of this aspect, but she winds up being buried alive, essentially. Um, they do find... Um, dirt in her lungs, uh, during the autopsy. So it's, it's horrible. These guys get arrested for something else. Um, and then get questioned about the Ma Duncan stuff, essentially confess to it for absolutely no benefit to them. They, they don't ask for any leniency in terms of their yeah. sentencing. Ma Duncan gets sentenced to death. They also get sentenced to death. All three of them killed on the same day. Uh, and if I recall correctly, she's the last woman to be executed in the state of California. And and the the two killers, they were like joking right up to the point where they were killed, weren't they? Yeah. Once again, just these you, you can't write this stuff. Yeah. The guys are <laughs> literally joking as they're being walked into uh, the gas chamber and then sit down next to each other and talking about, oh, they, they I just heard the pill drop and that's it. Damn. Yeah. Yeah, crazy, crazy story. I knew that was a good story. Um, I had filmed that episode with Danielle, and I went to get a haircut. 
And uh, I go to the same person all the time and she was, she always loves hearing whatever the current story is. So I was retelling it to her and I noticed that other people in the salon were all looking at me. And so I started kind of lowering my voice as I was continuing with it. And then they were like, hold on, hold on. Are you just like telling a story or is that all actually true? <laughs> I'm like, no, it's, <laughs> it's actually true. And they're like, oh, well, speak up. We want to hear where, where this goes and what happens. Yeah, it, 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 it sounds like a black comedy movie, you know, yeah. like, like, like a dark comedy. And yeah. Yeah, it really could be. It absolutely could be. Um, it is just, it's so bizarre to see the lengths that Ma goes to. And it's strange because she has this love for her son that I think you could certainly understand if, if you're a parent. But there's also this line that she just completely obliterates in terms yeah. of decency. Um, and yeah, yeah, just a super, super interesting character. Uh, if I remember right, I think the LA Times made some comment about her being one of the most interesting criminals of all time or something along those lines. It was, yeah, mind-blowing story. All right. where So YouTube, the best place to follow you? Yeah, YouTube uh, is the best place to follow me. Lorden Arts is the channel. I also have a website. You can go to www.lordenarts.com, L-O-R-D-A-N-A-R-T-S. Uh, you can find... Pretty much all my stuff uh, right from there. I've got links to uh, the channel, which of course has three men in a mystery episodes on it. Um, there's a separate link for the crime after crime channel. We do post YouTube versions of that as well. But if you are just a strict uh, podcast user, just search for crime after crime or three men in a mystery and you can find it. All right. Well, thank you so much for uh, spending some time with us. And, Absolutely. And, and and thank you for everything you do to help these people with their, uh, well, missing people and uh, cases that are unsolved. It's, uh, I'm sure it's, it's not the, the easiest stuff to go over on a regular basis. So It isn't, but I've said it many times, and I don't see it ending anytime soon. It is by far, uh, I feel like, the most important and gratifying work that I've ever done in my life. <laughs> And Where to the Road Go would not be possible without the help of our Patreons. And uh, especially those patrons pledging $10 or more. Allison Cook, Lindsay Marie Trebet, Nick Martin, Super Inframan, UFO Weekly News, Tim, 36 Dingo, Maria, Jennifer Campbell, Mike McGuire, American Rambler, Paul Buscini, Nate Syria, Anthony Sullivan, Kevin, John Rutledge Foster III, Eric Citron, Ben Crow, Janet Runyon, Andy McManara, Sasha Lorg, Matthias Sunby, Christopher Vaughn, Riker and Stark, Robert Groom, Sean Cosgrove, Jose A., Roger Gonzalez, Craig Cicernos, Kevin Schreck, A.E. Gaia Quinta, William Lovelace, Mark Brady, Chris, Isa Hot Dog a Sandwich, John Eddy, Carla Mahoney, and Chris Johnson, thank you all so very much. All right, I hope you enjoyed that conversation. John stuck around a bit uh, to do a Patreon segment with me where we talked a bit about the smiley face killers, murders, whatever you want to refer to them as. So we got into a little, a little in-depth about that, what may really be going on there, and if there really are some patterns. Keep stories coming our way. We have a few listener stories, shows that I have to put up yet. Um, but yeah, if you have a, a paranormal story, a paranormal experience, something odd that's happened to you, feel free to send it along to stories at wheredidtheroadgo.com. And uh, we will either have you on to talk about it or, or we will discuss it in a future show. And we'll see you next time. You have been listening to Where Did the Road Go? This show is made possible in part from our Patreons, and we thank you and everyone listening for helping us continue this exploration of the strange. You can always find everything Where Did the Road Go related at www.wheredidtheroadgo.com. And thank you so much for your support.